Before we dive into today's episode, We want to remind you that the views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the hosts and guests and for educational and entertaining purposes. The Professional Homegirl Podcast is here to celebrate the diverse voices, stories, and experiences of women of color, providing a platform for authentic and empowering conversations. There will be some kiki some tears, but most importantly, A reminder that tough times don't last, but professional homegirls do. Enjoy the show. Today, we're discussing a topic that affects many people, but is still often misunderstood and stigmatized. Suicide. Suicide is a complex and multifaceted issue that can have devastating consequences for individuals, families, and communities. But while suicide can be a difficult and uncomfortable topic to discuss, It's also one that deserves our attention and compassion. Today, we're speaking with a special guest who has firsthand experience with suicide, mental health struggles, and resilience. She will share her personal story of surviving suicide twice, discussing the importance of mental health awareness and support, and offering insights and advice for others who may be struggling. So to my guest, how are you doing? How are you feeling? I'm good. I'm excited to be here. Just happy, honestly. (laughs) Yes, yes. Listen, y'all, my guest, she's a superhero. She's out here saving the world (laughs) one person at a time. So I'm super excited to have you on the show. So thank you so much for joining us. Of course. So I can imagine that sharing your personal story can be difficult. How challenging has it been for you to open up about your experiences and share them with others? To be very truthful, um, it Honestly, okay, I'm happy that you asked this question. This is the initial question. I had an experience yesterday where I was preparing for a speech and um, doing a lot of practicing and writing and timing, all those things that go into it. And I got emotional. And that's the first time that that's Mm. happened in an extremely long time. Um, And it was really more so because I was thinking about all those individuals that are currently in the position that I was in, say, eight to nine years ago. Mm. Um, So the story isn't difficult to tell now. Um, I had to get to a space in my healing journey where it was comfortable and I was okay with um, being this transparent. But the times that it gets emotional isn't necessarily for myself, but just kind of empathizing with individuals that are going through those challenges at that time. Yeah, that that has to be like, difficult and really hard I can only imagine just hearing somebody else's story and I just be like damn like I just wish I can just take it all away from you yeah for sure what do you believe are some of the factors that contribute to higher rates of suicide within our community oh man what doesn't right (laughs) yeah Um, when I was thinking about this question I was like I feel like just being black in America is like (laughs) yeah like really like break us right it's definitely a lot Um, I mean, the first being uh, environmental, honestly. So um, the areas that, and I don't want to say this as if our entire community lives in this manner, but being realistic is that financial hardship, um, not growing up in full family homes, just a lot of different things, violence, you know what I mean? There's Mm -hmm. a lot of different things that are going on that affect us. And then seeing violence on TV against our community, on social media, on social media against our community every day is very much so impactful. Um, But bigger than that, lack of resources, lack of education, lack of Mm -hmm. understanding and research for our actual community and how those outs... Yeah, lack of support, but how those outside forces are affecting those numbers. So there's a lack of research as why we can't even answer this question. We know, right? but people aren't able to help us because they're not necessarily putting us in those numbers of what is making us more vulnerable. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, When I was doing research on this, somebody said that lack of representation Mm -hmm. within this. And I was like, oh, that's so serious because in our community, it's so like taboo. Yes, very much. Why do you think some people believe that asking someone about their suicidal thoughts or or intentions could actually lead to them considering or attempting suicide rather than providing the opportunity for support and intervention? I think it's based on fear on the other person's side. So not knowing how to react if that person were to say yes. 
So going back to stigma again, it's just mm-hmm. like if we don't have understanding of how to support somebody, if that answer were to come back, it's easier for us to say, you know what, I'm not going to ask it at all. Right. Um, so it's very easy to simply not ask it again um, and then to take on the idea and that, um, oh gosh, what's the word? My mind just went blank. To take on the, oh my gosh. Okay, I'll just keep going. I lost the actual word. <laughs> but <laughs> to take on the false idea that you're actually implanting that idea into somebody's head or putting that thought into somebody's head when it's the exact opposite, just like you said. Mm -hmm. What would you say are some common misconceptions about this? Oh, man, Um, that it's selfish. I would say Mm. that's the biggest one. Um, Another misconception is that it is... Only young people do it? Yeah, and only others do it that Black people don't. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, There are a lot, but I would definitely say the biggest one I hear is uh, it's selfish. And I didn't know the signs. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that when people say that it's selfish? Because I had a conversation with another guest and her father committed suicide. And then she gave a two part question on how she felt about it before and now being able to, you know, since she experienced it afterwards. So how do you feel about it when people say it's a selfish decision? Um, I can understand it. And I know a lot of people talk out of grief and out of pain and everybody experiences things differently. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's honestly not even just with suicide. Anytime that we lose something, lose somebody, it's always a space of, okay, well, that was selfish in a way of how this happened. They took this from me. Something was taken from me. Right. Um, so I don't take offense to it. It's just an opportunity to educate and to have that conversation and to move past it. So I don't necessarily like get angry about it. It's mm-hmm. just like, okay, well, that's perfectly fine that you feel that way, but let's talk about it. How can we help shape and change the narrative? I feel like you a real patient person. I am. I, I can tell a lot. <laughs> Like for somebody to piss you off, they, they got to be OD and on you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like you probably be like, no, this is how it happened. <laughs> it does not happen like this. Like <laughs> there is another side. So, you know, it does take a lot for that to come out. It's funny. I was in therapy years ago when I first started in my early 20s. Mm-hmm. And I used to have a lot of anger issues and challenges. And I was telling my therapist like a dream I had about fighting somebody. And you she probably was fucked like, them up in a dream. <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah. And she was like, I didn't know that this was something that we needed to work on. She's like, you just, I never got that from you. I'm like, yeah, I have. I can get there. Um, it's a lot better, but that is definitely a side. Child, let me find out you got them hands, <laughs> child. <laughs> now, were you familiar with the concept of suicide before your first attempt? And if so, how did you know about it? I was how did not, you find out? I had no idea. I had no idea about suicide. I had no idea about anxiety, depression, suicidal ideations. I had no, I was 12, right? Right. Um, And so it was a time in our community. Gosh, it was what, 2002? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, 2002. And um, that was 20 years ago, right? Yes. Wow. So um, yeah, that was at a time where we didn't talk about mental health at all we didn't talk about mental health until not too long ago recently right recently so um without having that conversation without having those resources you don't really have the language and that's what's really important right I think that is so funny how like because we're in the same age group so just when I was growing up like nobody talked about it and now you can't you can't stop hearing it like it's everywhere which is a great thing because it gives people a space to be able to express how they feel But I'm just like, wow, like we just started doing this. Yeah, but, you know, I think um, it's interesting that you said that because a lot of people are like, well, and the numbers are rising, but a lot of it has to do with proper reporting. So if somebody passes by suicide and 
again, like going back to language, that's another thing that we like to say is pass by suicide, die by suicide, just because um, when we say commit, it often brings the idea of a negative connotation, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when you hear somebody say commit a crime or commit murder or do this, this or that, it brings again this negative idea of somebody that was simply just in pain. That's a good um, point you made. Yeah. So yeah. that's something that I learned just a few years ago and it's consistently changing, but currently that's the language that we use when talking about suicide. Um, but when it comes to proper reporting, a lot of things go into that. If somebody passes by suicide, that brings up challenges with life insurance, right? Mm. It brings up challenges with, um, cause do life insurance stigma. cover it? Not to cut you off, but I do don't life insurance cover it? Yay or nay. I don't want to be incorrect and provide false information. I just know that it's probably not the easiest thing to get situated. Right. Yeah. I don't mm -hmm. want to provide wrong information on that. Um, so I'll just throw that out there. But it does bring up a lot of challenges following. And then a lot of families don't want to say like, hey, my family member passed by suicide. So mm -hmm. they don't report it as such. So it could be reported as an overdose. It can be reported as so many other things instead of it actually what it is. Mm -hmm. So I think that we're having That's a conversation fact. now. Yeah, we're having the conversation now to where people are comfortable enough to say, no, this is what happened. This is our situation and so forth. So um, reporting has a lot to do with it. Mm. What was your upbringing like? It was great. Um, I know your mom was a doctor. Your, your well, daddy my mom's was an, an attorney. Entrepreneur. Yeah, my mom's an attorney. Um, mm -hmm. My dad was an entrepreneur. Oh, I thought and... she was a doctor. No, 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 no. She's an attorney. And um, it was it was beautiful. Went to a great school, had mm -hmm. um, a great upbringing, but I started having sexual abuse when I was 12, all the way up until I was 18. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So, you know, there are a lot of things that go beyond what something looks like. I did an interview a while ago and the introduction of me was interesting. Um, she's like, yeah, she was the first one I knew that drove a Benz and she had all this, this and that. And I had to take a step back and I'm like, hey, like, like one, I don't like to be introduced as such. Right. And two, um, there isn't a face to mental illness. There isn't a face to suicide. Um, there isn't a face to mental health challenges whatsoever. So I think I got looked over a lot because of what I had or what my upbringing was like. And then I also never felt validated in my feelings because I did have such an awesome upbringing. So outside of that particular trauma, um, I was just a child that was struggling emotionally all the way around. And nobody knew what was going on with you? No. No. Wow. We, you know, we know how to hide stuff, right? You know what's so funny? When I was doing research, right, on your particular story, and I was like, damn, like, she comes from a good family. Like, you have a really good upbringing. So I was one of those people that was like, I wonder what made her, like, have that first um, attempt. And I was like, it had to be something. And I, it never dawned on me that it was sexual abuse because I'm like, what else could it be? Yeah, that's actually a piece of my story that has always been a missing link. Yeah, um, and it's Because I wasn't in the space. And you asked me the question earlier, is it hard to tell my story? I'm now just in the space of that piece of my story being okay to tell because it's mine to tell. And when it comes to that topic, it gets so icky and it gets so just nasty people are nasty the press is nasty um you still have family members like it's just it's not just one individual that's involved um so now i'm in a current space of healing i'm in a good place of plugging that in but um it wasn't until i did an interview with people digital maybe like a year or so ago mm -hmm. and they kept harping on it and pushing it and pushing it. okay well what made you have your first attempt Right. And I'm like, because that was my next like, question. What led up to your first attempt? Yeah, I couldn't and I was figure like, it out. Yeah, I was like, mm, I don't want to talk about like, and I didn't recognize that it was such a missing link because I gotten so used to giving this speech and this story of what I felt safe doing. And I stand by that. Like, I'm happy I didn't share right. at that point in time in my life, which is what very important was. Yeah. So understanding what you're comfortable with and what you're able to actually talk about if you are in a place of advocacy is key because you can't help anybody if you're still hurting. Wow. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, you, you got my brain like going now. Because <laughs> now it makes sense. Because one of the things I read in that article was how you always felt um, a sense of sadness. Mm-hmm. But I can see why. Yeah, for sure. And from 12 to 18, that's a long time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, when you're ready to tell, do, do your family know who did it or? Um, yes. Yes, they're aware. And it, I'm assuming it's someone in the family? Yeah, it was a family member. It was a cousin. Wow. I'm so sorry that happened to you. Oh, it's, a, well, it's not okay, but um, I'm right. still in a healing space um, when it comes to that. Like, I'm not totally like, yeah, let's go into detail. And right, give right. That. But um, it is a topic that I am moving and like just moving through continuously. Yeah, navigating. Perfect word. Yeah, still navigating. Right. So how did you know to take a lot of pills during your first attempt if you did if you wasn't familiar with suicide? You know, honestly, I can't even tell you that. That's such a great question. I've never even been asked that before. And it was such a dark time and such a mm-hmm. blocked out time for me that that was just instinct. Wow. So maybe, yeah, it was instinct for me. I was in the, I mean, I was in the bathroom mm-hmm. and um, I just saw medication. I decided to take it. So I don't know if that's such a good question. I never even thought about why or how I need to do so. Interesting. When, when I tell you I was researching you, cause I'm like, I see. <laughs> You better than people, okay? Oh, come on now. Don't play with the professional <laughs> home, girl. We gonna get to the bottom I of it. I love it. I love it. But I'm just thinking of a 12-year-old psyche. Like, you never knew anything about it. You're 12 years old. So it's like, what made you do that? Because I interviewed another guest and she was saying how what made her decide to do su- the, um try to do suicide was she saw it on a cartoon. Mm. And I was like, what? So I'm like, I wonder how you found out. Yeah, you know, um, again, I didn't necessarily have the language to say, hey, this is what's happening. I knew for a fact that I didn't want to live anymore. And that's right. something you don't have to research. That's something you don't have to look up. Right. Um, I just knew that I wanted it to stop. So as a child, the only connection I can make is that you take one pill, it makes your head stop. If you take multiple, it make everything stop. So that's the mm-hmm. only type of connection that I can make. But as far as like getting on Google and doing all of that, I don't know. Right. Well, we didn't have Google back then, did we? I don't know, girl. It's been a long time. I know. I know there's this post that's like, you don't believe me or my kids or whoever doesn't believe me when I say I'm older than Google because Google <laughs> really isn't that old. And I'm like, oh, man, right. definitely I think YouTube, my 30s. <laughs> I think YouTube is like, what, 15? If that old? That is so wild. I know. So when you woke up the next day, how did you feel? Sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt very sad. Um, And I felt this burden of. uh, I now have this bigger secret than what I had before, which is I have depression. And again, not knowing the language at the time, I'm using it properly now. So um I called it like a secret. So now that I not only have the secret of not wanting to be happy or not feeling happy and having these feelings of anxiety, but I also tried to take my own life. These are all secrets that I was a 12 year old girl having. Um, So it was more so of sadness that it didn't work and that it was a space of, um, Burden. Yeah, I felt very burdened. Were you angry? Oh, yeah, very much so. Mm. What are some signs or symptoms that should um, that parents or caregivers or educators should be aware of that may indicate a child is experiencing suicidal thoughts or behaviors? Yeah, um, I would say isolation would be number one. Mm -hmm. Um, So you know, it's completely fine wanting to have you time. I think we all need you time. I was just telling my doctor the other day, um, actually Monday, I had an appointment. No, Mm -hmm. today's Wednesday. So Tuesday, yesterday, um, I had an appointment. Today feel like Thursday, right? Or Friday? It feels like Sunday. That's not today. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But, um, 
yeah so she was just asking essentially like how I was feeling I was like I'm not isolating but I'm chilling like I want to be by myself a little bit Mm because I'm working so much she's like that's fair so I would definitely point out isolation I isolated a lot at that time in my life Mm -hmm. um a lack of sleep or sleeping too much anything Mm -hmm. that's disturbing an appetite so a lack of appetite anxious feelings crying spells Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of things that we write off is in, oh, they're just being a preteen or they're just being a teenager definitely deserve to be looked into a little bit more. And it's really just by asking those questions like, Hey, what was good in your day? What was bad in your day? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, not just asking how was your day? Cause a kid and even adults will say I'm fine. Or today was fine. I'm okay. Somebody how they're doing like, I'm good. Instead of saying, hey, how are you feeling? That's actually forcing them to identify something that's going on on the inside, which is really important. So okay. isolation, lack of sleep, change in appetite, uh, change in mood, crying spells. I would point those out. Now, 10 years later, you made a second attempt at the age of 22. Can you share some of those events or factors that led up to this time? One thing I will say, when you were talking about college and not having no money and being stressed out, I was like, man, <laughs> I definitely feel her on that one because I had a great time in college, but it was hard, especially when you didn't have no money. Yeah, college was not. I didn't enjoy school even as a kid. Really? No, I didn't. I mean, and when I got to college, it wasn't the school part I enjoyed. I loved to party. And, you know, that was like a piece of college. And Once I got serious about my um, academics and I got stable, then it changed for me. But to answer your question, um, I was extremely sleep deprived. I was experiencing a lot of symptoms of bipolar disorder, which I Mm -hmm. didn't know at the time. Um, But without sleep, with heavy drinking, heavy smoking, uh, just a lot going on. You was lit. A lot of, yeah, I was 24 (laughs) seven. It wasn't even about you probably wouldn't even know I was under the influence high maybe, but everything I was probably like, Oh, she's just chilling. And it was really just me attempting to maintain some form of stability, right. some type of like hoping I don't have a mood swing within the next 30 minutes type thing. Right. Um, and I just got, I was just exhausted. Like mm. I really was, I was just exhausted. So I was probably on like two to three days of not sleeping. Um, And I just remember being at school and again, choosing the route of medication. And I was like, I just, I can't, I can't do this. I I can't do this. And then I had been, um, I had been living with suicide ideation since I was a kid. So it wasn't just something that popped back up. I had been not wanting to live for a very long time, Right. but I was hospitalized and so forth, but I'm sure we'll get there. Yeah. (laughs) So did you feel comfortable speaking to any of your friends while you was in college? Yes, yes, yes. So um, I talked to a girlfriend of mine from high school Mm -hmm. and um, I was just sharing with her that I needed help and I didn't necessarily know what it would look like. But I think that individuals around me recognized that one, I weighed maybe like 110 pounds, possibly like heaviest. Um, Mm. So I was tiny. I was very irritable. Um, I just was not in a good headspace. And my anger was just like through the roof. So it wasn't like, oh, she's in a bad mood at this moment in time. It was really more so like, nah, she's like in a rage almost. And she's not sleeping. She's heavily under the influence. And so she actually found a place for me to go to. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess like an inpatient stay or something like that. I didn't go, but um, that was the conversation I recall. But many things, I honestly, my memory is very vague. Right. Um, yeah, a lot of it is still quite foggy. Like I can pull bits and pieces. The more I do therapy and the more I talk about it, the more vivid things become. But some things are just missing in action. Which honestly. is understandable. Because yeah. sometimes our brain blocks out trauma mm-hmm. to yep. protect us. So. Exactly, exactly. So when you woke up in the hospital, did you know where you was at? Like, did you know what happened? Um, Yeah, I mean, I was taken to the hospital and I definitely, it was not 
under a happy space to say the very least. Um, mm -hmm. cause I was not just suicidal. I was homicidal as well. Um, and a lot of people don't know that about my story. So you get a little gem right Come on now. Give us the tea now. Come on now. Yeah. I was homicidal as well. And well, um, explain it, please. Um, homicidal is what it says, which is homicide killing. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just a very aggressive and, um, yeah, I don't really know what else to explain. Have you tried to hurt somebody before? No, absolutely not. I mean, I didn't act on it, but those were, when you have an ideation, it's just simply what it is. It's an idea. So no, I didn't attack anybody. Um, that wasn't the case, but that's definitely marked in my chart. <laughs> <laughs> the way you laughing right now, <laughs> yo, somebody would have tried you. <laughs> <laughs> so when your family found out about the attempts and your mental health challenges, where were their reaction? Um, it was very, um, I think they were scared more than anything. I think they were just fearful of not knowing what to do mm -hmm. and not necessarily having the resources to help me. So it was a family effort. I was hospitalized at a public hospital at first. And then I was transferred to a private hospital. But even just getting into a private hospital took about two to three days. Um, mm. And private hospitals are very expensive. If you don't have insurance, it's almost impossible. But even with insurance, it is just obnoxious. That's a lot of money. Breaks. Yeah. Um, and then public hospitals almost feel like prison. And I've been to jail, so it does feel like prison. No, we got to come on now. <laughs> Wait, yeah. what'd you go to jail for? Uh, a DUI. <laughs> <laughs> not for my thoughts, not for my ideations, but for my DUI. <laughs> nah, don't play with my sis, y'all. <laughs> I know who I'm gonna call if I need some help. Because <laughs> I'm like, what? How you just gonna slide that in there? Yeah, I've been to jail. <laughs> well, I thought you knew. No, but... When I tell you, when I was researching you, I'm like, where are the missing pieces? Like, it was given like, it was given very like, um, what's the word? Like surface. Mm. Like, I feel like the obviously the main goal is to educate people and to help those who are really in need. But when, you know, like, I love to get to know people. So I'm trying to like read more about you. And I'm like, come on now, something ain't adding up here. But I was like, I'm gonna get to the bottom of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was 25, but we'll follow the timeline and then you can throw it back in when you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So wait, is there a history of mental health issues within your family? Um, yes. I think mm. that's with anybody. Um, a lot of it's gone on most. Um, and then my family's had a lot of addiction as well. So mm, yeah, but I mean, that's nothing but a mental health challenge as well, right? Right. So um, a lot of it was there. I actually found out a cousin of mine had bipolar disorder prior to me finding out. I found out a year before I did that I knew I had it. Mm -hmm. But when she said it, I'm like, that sounds like me. And um, I was diagnosed literally like a year later. Mm, and how did you feel when you finally got the, the news? Because you always was, felt like something was, was different. Like, hey, this makes sense. Like, I appreciate it. I see why I'm in debt. I see mm -hmm. why my space has been outrageous. I see why um, all these things were happening to me and happening around me. And I was doing to myself, just not taking care of myself or valuing my life. It just all made sense. So... Um, I was relieved. I'm not gonna say I was excited, but I had diagnosed myself anyway, like on and don't do this, whoever's listening, don't get on the internet and take those quizzes. Um, but when I was diagnosed, I was like, I knew it. I found out two weeks ago. I was on Google and they told me <laughs> this is what I had. Um, but I did get an official diagnosis when I was hospitalized. Mm. Do you think like families should have conversations with their children or just within the family talking about mental health issues? Because I feel like a lot of things that we experience could have been avoided if you would have told me what time it was a long time ago. I mean, I think it'd be beneficial, but I also think that we have to take the step of 
mental health the same way we do physical health and mm-hmm. not just included as mental health means mental illness, because that's not the truth. So if we were to have conversations and being proactive about our mental health, I guess, not even I guess, I believe I would have been able to manage anxiety better. I would have been able to identify those feelings of depression. I would have been able right. to, again, not just manage, but live with and maneuver and to navigate, like we said earlier, those um, different feelings. So I think just having that conversation of mental health, like brain health, the same way as like eat your veggies. Right. I want kids, but if I were to have them, like I have a niece and I have nephews and I'm like, hey, like take a breath. Let's do a breathing exercise. Let's Mm -hmm. fill in today. Like let's identify something. So having those conversations are extremely important. But as far as disclosing um, different mental illness within the family, um, you know, I if I were to and I'm not I don't want to have kids um, Mm. and that's definitely something we can also talk about. I could talk to you for days. Yeah, it's giving bestie. I were to, um, I would definitely disclose my diagnosis and definitely disclose that our family has had challenges. I feel Mm -hmm. like we talk more so about addiction in Black families than we do mental illness. Like, oh, you know, your uncle, whatever, whatever, whatever. And it's like, oh, okay. Like, he was lit last time I saw him. That makes sense now. Um, But yeah, outside of that, I think it's just a conversation we need to have and we need to learn the skills behind it outside of the conversation as well. Why you don't want to have kids? I'm just curious because I feel like um not that it matters. Mm-hmm. I, I have an idea, but why you don't want to have kids? Um, one, I don't want to pass along my diagnosis. Mm-hmm. Um, somebody said, well, it seems like it'd be easier if they did have it because they'd have you to lean on. And I'm like, okay, first of all, that's not really how it works. Right. Granny give a one of the best support systems. Um, but I don't think I would be able to deal with I don't want to call it guilt but I don't I'm unsure the feelings mm. that come up if I came across my child having the same diagnosis as myself because it is genetic um that's a major reason um a second major reason is that I've been on medication for so long I don't know how it would interact and I don't want to have a child that would have inter- an interaction or a reaction to the medication that I've been on. Mm-hmm. Um, because we don't, I mean, I'm pro medication for myself. That's a decision for each individual. But I'm also aware that it has long lasting effects. And I don't know what could happen if I were to get pregnant. And if I were to birth a child, I don't want them to come out and have physical or mental, you know, challenges because of my condition. Right. And then the, I can't, I, I'm choosing not to come off of medication. Um, cause that's just a high risk for me. So being pregnant, going through all of those hormones and having those different situations, I definitely don't, uh, it's not something that I want to put myself at risk. So it's really to maintain a right. health yeah, it's for my own personal health. I feel like um, Selena Gomez, actually, I don't know anything about Selena. I'm not going to lie, but she lives <laughs> in a color disorder. I do know that. But I was so excited and so proud um, for her making the comment on I can't have kids because I can't come off of medication. And a lot of people mm. were offended by that. But I stood with her. I'm like, girl, I feel the same way. But a lot right. of people- like, well, I don't, you can, you just choose not to. And it's like, no, I actually, I can't because I can't come off of medication. Like that's dangerous for me. Like that's not an option, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, So, you know, it's up for debate, but um, as far as me, and then I just, I got a niece and two beautiful nephews. I'm cool. Like I'm good with being the auntie. Like I don't, those three main reasons, and I like it. I like chilling. I don't really want to wake up and hear nothing nagging and crying. And another <laughs> I have to manage myself. <laughs> so if you that- didn't, if you didn't list all of those factors, would a baby be an option? Um, I used to want to be a mom. Mm-hmm. 
And then it just switched in me. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just switched in me. So I don't think so. I don't know. Because this is my reality and I don't necessarily live outside of it. So I can't I can't honestly answer that. I don't know if right. I don't know what my like without my diagnosis. Right. Therefore, yeah. I don't know what my answer would be. Right. Do you feel like more celebrities should come out and speak openly about their mental health? No, I believe that each person to each his own. I don't think that everybody has to have or anybody that's on a platform has to come out and say, well, me too. I have this diagnosis and I share it with the world. Like, absolutely not. It's a choice that I decided to do. Um, It's definitely something that was um, a need for me. Um, when I was hospitalized, I actually had a dream that I was standing on a stage with a bright, like a bright light in front of me. Mm-hmm. And I woke up, I was like, that's interesting. And then mm. six years later, that was like my reality. Like I was on a stage, I was speaking and I was sharing my story, but going through my process and my journey to recovery, I definitely recognized I wasn't doing it just for myself. Right. Um, God gave me a much higher purpose and all of it started to make sense. So I definitely don't shame anybody for not talking about their mental health. I applaud individuals that do so in order to help other people, but it's not always meant to be, you know, put in the spotlight. I definitely don't think so. Right. So what is some advice you would give to someone who is currently experiencing similar feelings or contemplating suicide? Um, first I love to give a good resource. So they recently just launched, well, it'll be a year come July. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Come July. Um, but there's so many resources out there, but if you are feeling suicidal in this moment, or you're having feelings of suicide, um, or an attempt or a plan, or somebody's in crisis, please dial 988. That is just like 911 except it's for mental health and it's for mental health crises. So that's new, right? Yeah. Very Mm -hmm. new. Mm -hmm. Um, Love it. Big fan. Um, Yeah. It was a lot to get done. There were a lot of people that were advocating for it. There were a lot of people that pushed it and it was able to get through. I like it because it's very short. Uh, The original number was like, it was like a 1-800 number. That's a lot to dial. Just a lot going on. You Especially take- in a time of emergency. Exactly. So it's just a lot. It was a lot going on. But if you're not a phone person, that's cool too. If you don't want to talk on the phone, then I encourage you to text 741-741, which is mm-hmm. a crisis text line. Um, and you actually don't have to be in crisis if there is, um, if you're just in a place of needing to talk to somebody, they'll be able to give you that conversation. Um, but follow that up. If you are having those feelings of hopelessness and those feelings of not wanting to be here, or you're just in a really dark place. I really do encourage you want to use your resources and use those resources that I just listed. But if you have at least one person that you are able to be vulnerable with if you have at least one person that's in your support system that you can have a conversation with I do encourage you to do so um if you have a therapist reach out to your therapist if you need um I'm full of resources if you need funding for therapy I'll plug that in too yeah um and then there are even support groups yeah I get funding for my therapy it's called the love land foundation they do it mm-hmm. for black women and girls I heard of that Got out mm-hmm. to them Love them. Yes. 12 sessions. Um, they give vouchers for up to $120, which is amazing. That's pretty therapy good. Can be expensive. Right. Yeah, that's great. It takes a big chunk out of that. Right. Um, so, yeah, um, I would definitely encourage all of those different things. And for people who suspect that someone they know may be experiencing suicidal thoughts or behavior, but are unsure how to offer support, what is your advice on guidance you would give to them? Um, I would say, honestly, learn. Oh God, if people are going to be like, how am I supposed to do that? Learning how to ask that uncomfortable question. I used to work in suicide prevention 
And um, I wasn't always comfortable in being like, hey, are you suicidal or are you thinking of killing yourself? Like, what's going on? I had to take a softball approach, which was, hey, are you feeling like you don't want to wake up anymore? Or even just simply acknowledging that you see something different about that person. Hey, I recognize you're not smiling as much as you used to. What's Mm -hmm. going on? Are you talking about it? I recognize that you like to work out three to four times a week. You haven't worked out in a month. You're Mm -hmm. simply saying. Hey, I'm seeing that something is different. I'm worried about you and I care. Um, I think people want to be seen. We all want to be seen. And when somebody's struggling mentally, um, they want people to, they want help. Like they right. essentially, they may not know how to ask for it. Um, mm-hmm. So you don't even have to ask that hardball question, but picking up on, hey, my friend seems a little off today or this person seems a little bit off. I wonder what's going on. So just asking like, hey, I recognize that you're not doing this. You seem a little irritable, whatever the case may be, whatever seems different. Um, And simply just having a small conversation and offering those resources. I just said, yes, yes, yes. You know, I think this was an amazing conversation. I feel like every time I talk about this topic on my show, is is a really good conversation like with the girl who honored her father who committed suicide or who passed away from suicide that was a beautiful conversation i think this was also an amazing conversation so i want to say thank you so much for being a guest on the show thank you for having me of course of course and to the listeners if you or someone you know is struggling with suicidal thoughts or behaviors there is help available. Reach out to a trusted friend or a family mem- member, a mental health professional, or a crisis hotline because you are not alone. Thank you, everyone. Until next time. Later. You're not going to say bye? Oh, goodness. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>